it's after one. This um, session is being recorded so that people can um, access this later from the Cornell Berry website. And now we'll move into the meat of our program. And th this is where I want to make another um, explanation. I have to apologize to Dr. Mike Ellis, who is our guest um, from The Ohio State University. He is a professor and extension state specialist um, in uh, plant pathology and diseases of fruit crops. And he um, agreed to do this months ago, and for some reason, next to his uh, topic, I wrote down fruit rots, and in, uh, excuse me, root rots instead of fruit rots, but he will be talking about fruit rots today, which according to the feedback that we got is actually a really good thing because that is a problem for most of you. Now at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ellis, and Mike, you can turn your microphone on, and um, I'm going to let you take it from here. I'll turn mine off. Okay, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you beautifully. Okay, well, I've uh, hello everybody. Um, um, this is uh, quite an experience being on this webinar. I've, it's the first one I've ever done, and uh, I'm glad it's working out. I know Laura's worked real hard on it. Um, my presentation, I've been working on it. I hope I keep it right at about 30 minutes, so I'm going to have to get going. I hope I don't go too fast, but uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to share with you. I would like to emphasize I see quite a few people on here that are professionals, uh, educators, and the talk's really designed primarily for growers, but uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Uh, again, that's Mike Ellis. I'm with Ohio State University. I've been here about 30 years, so I've, I've been working with uh, strawberry fruit rots for quite some time. Uh, how do I start the PowerPoint? Um, Mike, just you can yeah. uh, just, uh, just hit the little arrow at the bottom, and we can. Um, okay, I've got it. All right. I want to get rid of. Oh, I've, there we go. Okay. Yep. All right. Let's hope we don't have any more technical difficulties. But at any rate, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me get going. First of all, when I talk about any type of uh, disease management, I try to emphasize uh, the importance of developing integrated management programs uh, for uh, diseases or whatever you're working with. And uh, I'm going to be talking about strawberry fruit rots here today. For me, uh, the major components of an integrated program are disease resistance, cultural practices, biological control if you have it, minimal fungicide use. Whenever I talk about fungicide use, I, I like to word, use the word minimal, and a knowledge of disease biology. Uh, for me, this knowledge of disease biology is something that a lot of people really overlook. And uh, I want to take the first part of my presentation today to try to emphasize the importance of understanding diseases, or at least having a basic understanding of them, in order to be able to control them effectively. Um, the knowledge is critical to the development of uh, disease management strategies. And I always say this to our growers, I say, how can you effectively manage a plant disease or actually anything without some knowledge about it? You know, the basic knowledge on ecology or epidemiology. The more you know about what you're trying to control, the better off you're going to be in terms of controlling it. And one thing I try to emphasize wherever I speak to growers is they need to find out what resources are available that have this information. Now, most states have excellent information. I know throughout the Northeast there is. In the Midwest, we have a series of publications. This is the Midwest Small Fruit Pest Management Handbook. It contains all the information I'm going to be presenting on fruit rots here today. We also have a Midwest Strawberry Production Guide. It has all this information in it. I'm not trying to sell these. I'm just trying to emphasize the importance of growers knowing what resources are out there and, and getting them and uh, looking at them, learning from them. So let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology and control of strawberry fruit rots. And here I'm going to try to go through the three major fruit rots and emphasize some things that we've learned that help us uh, understand them better and hopefully control them better. Our three major fruit rots are botrytis, leather rot, and anthracnose. I'll start with botrytis uh, fruit rot or gray mold. This is a typical symptom on a ripe fruit. It looks like a, a dead mouse. Anybody that's ro raised raspberries or, or strawberries is familiar with botrytis. It's probably the most common uh, fruit rot disease and it's probably responsible for most of the fungicides worldwide that are applied to strawberries. Um, again, this is the symptoms in the field. Now, 
when I first started about 30 years ago, uh, growers in the Midwest and the East used to spray fungicides for botrytis to control it from early spring, pre-bloom through harvest. This could result in four to six applications of fungicide or more. And this is what was perceived was the need in order to control this disease. Um, I gotta remember where to click here. I just want to go over some studies that uh, were conducted, you know, many years ago actually, but have really let us develop a good understanding of this disease and I think it really allows us to control it better. First of all, we used to think that botrytis was everywhere. It came in from outside the planting and it was just ambiguous everywhere. Actually, we've learned that uh, the, the fungus actually forms latent infections during late summer and fall in apparently healthy leaves. Uh, you could have a planting out there, it looks absolutely beautiful, perfectly healthy, but it can be infected with botrytis. Some of the leaves in this planting right here are infected and if you clear them you can actually see the mycelium of botrytis within the leaves. Well, uh, you go into the fall, the plants go dormant, you cover up with spring and obviously this is a perennial matted row. Um, but underneath that straw, that uh, fungus, uh, the leaves die, uh, uh, the fungus becomes saprophytic, active, and if you go out there in the spring and uh, dig out some of the leaf litter, this is a student of mine that was actually studying sporulation uh, several years ago, um, and you put it, you get down there and look, you can actually see botrytis sporulating um, uh, on the surface. Um, I don't know how to, I, I forgot how to use the uh, mouse on this thing. Mike? I think. Right. You've yeah, got I've got it right here. There's, you can actually see um, the uh, fungus uh, exporulating. Uh, this is just a close up of some uh, uh, additional litter. Um, trying to get the handle on the mouse here. Anyway, the point we're trying to make is virtually 99% uh, of all the f uh, m um, inoculum that comes from botrytis in your, in your planting comes out of that row in the litter uh, early in the spring. But what's most important that we've learned is the fact that virtually all, probably 90% or more of the uh, infections that occur from botrytis occur during bloom. Now this is an extremely important point um, and it was uh, um, uh, it really emphasizes the importance of uh, having some knowledge. Now, this is a flower. The fungus colonizes uh, old flower parts, senescent parts. It actually moves down into the um, uh, receptacle of the fruit where it develops a latent infection. It sits there because the tissue on green fruit is not susceptible uh, to rot. Um, this is from some work that we were doing uh, um, on uh, infection of the fruit and actually this center uh, berry right here has a latent infection in it. So it sits there, you're looking at your field, you got green fruit, everything looks great and then as the fruit starts to mature the fungus, the fruit physiology changes, the fungus becomes active and it causes a rot. And you can see here that the rot really developed around the calyx end of the of the fruit or the flower and this is when the symptoms of botrytis show up and this is what you see in the field. In the past people would see this they would start spraying. Obviously if the infection occurred during bloom any sprays that you're putting on out here now are a waste of money and time and uh, um, a very inefficient use of, uh, of fungicide. At any rate, uh, so this I hope this is probably about the best uh, definition of, of understanding the disease and how it's helped us to control it. So we know for control of botrytis uh, applications of fungicide during bloom are absolutely critical. Um, and uh, actually as far as the success story I would say in Ohio now instead of uh, four to six applications per year for botrytis growers just targeting um, uh, applications during bloom and matted row systems probably sp spray twice maybe at the most three times so we're looking at at least a 50 percent uh, reduction in fungicide use. Now anthracnose fruit rot of strawberry. Um, anthracnose is an extremely devastating disease um, and uh, it's, it's very interesting and difficult to work with. This is the symptom on fruit uh, this is on a plastic culture berry chandler and with several lesions on it. Uh, these lesions are actually covered with spore masses. This uh, uh, fungus is a splash dispersed so when a raindrop hits that lesion it just blows uh, spores all over uh, surrounding fruit so it can spread very rapidly in the field. 
In the past, anthracnose was thought of a warm weather or southern disease of strawberry. It was not considered a problem in northern production areas. When I first got here, again, 30 years ago, we never heard of anthracnose. Anthracnose fruit rot caused by Colototricum was epidemic for the first time in Ohio in 1991. Uh, economic damage was uh, not observed prior to this date, as far as I know. Um, anthracnose, again, it likes hot, wet weather. In 1991, we had 80 degree temperatures, 85 to 90 uh, throughout the Midwest and Northeast from the beginning of bloom through harvest with plenty of rain. Therefore, this anthracnose uh, epidemic developed uh, and it occurred across the entire Midwest and uh, Northeast. This is a planting of late growth strawberries that uh, um, um, it's in its second year of production. This is on a farm near Worcester where I've done a lot of research. And uh, this is uh, about two acres out of ten acres. And actually, uh, this is the second year, the first year of production. It was beautiful production, uh, no fruit rots. This year is 1991, the hot year. The grower called me up and said, hey, we got a problem. We're seeing spots on the fruit. I went out and looked, and within a week, 85% of the fruit in that two-acre planting looked like this. It's infected with anthracnose. Extremely devastating. This was one of the most devastating losses uh, that I'd really ever experienced uh, in a strawberry planting. At any rate, uh, anthracnose, once it shows up, it is uh, an absolute nightmare. Our big question was, where did it come from? This grower that uh, uh, where this late glow planting was, uh, I'd been growing strawberries for over 40 years, and this was the first time we'd ever seen it. So our big questions are, where did it come from, and how was it introduced into the planting? Well, we know that anthracnose is introduced into the field on infected transplants. Um, some beautiful work by uh, Mark Gleason at Ohio State and his students. This leaf right here uh, is a perfectly normal, healthy leaf, but uh, when you look at it microscopically, uh, this is a piece of mycelium of Colototricum acutatum actually growing on the surface of this healthy leaf and producing a canidia. These canidia are infective. Here's another shot of some mycelium on the surface of the leaf and canidia. So, uh, this fungus can move around very, very effective, effectively on healthy looking nursery stock. So you don't know if you have it. There's no indexing program for it. Um, so we know that it moves around and it's just uh, kind of a pig in the poke. Uh, if you're lucky, you don't have, you've got clean plants and if you're unlucky, you have uh, um, uh, the potential for anthracnose epidemic in your, in your, uh, in your planting. So, uh, and we don't know, if, you don't know if you have it till it shows up. So, what uh, I've been telling growers and trying to work with them is in growing seasons where you experience hot weather uh, through bloom and harvest, hot wet weather, you should consider having fungicides in your program for anthracnose control. In relation to plastic culture, which is growing uh, in popularity rapidly in Ohio and in, in many areas, the use of a fungicide, a good fungicide program for control of anthracnose is mandatory. It's just the nature of this uh, production system. Anthracnose is a potential threat all the time, and you need to have a good um, fungicide program for anthracnose control and plastic uh, culture. Uh, Mike, could I just Hello? interrupt for a second? Yeah. Did you did you see yeah. that um, question from Gwen Smith about everbearing and whether or not you can control? well because of the continuous bloom and and maybe you don't want to answer any uh, questions until the end of your presentation I don't know I think I think I better get through this and answer them at the end but that that, that is an excellent question and uh, um, I try to talk to that primarily in my handout but uh, let me go on through okay, okay that sounds great but people keep um, typing your questions as they come to you and we can go back yeah. over them at the end of the presentation that 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 is an, an absolutely excellent question. The difference between perennial matted row and plastic culture is, is um, you know, it's a whole different world. Most of everything we've worked with and, and the bulk of our production is perennial matted row, but uh, um, um, that is a good point in terms of uh, timing fungicides, but uh, I'll try to talk to that later. I got this down pretty well, hopefully to about 30 minutes, uh, so I've tried to ha uh, hang with that, and uh, I, I think we'll have about 15 minutes at the end. Anyway, I'd like to talk a little bit about leather rot right now. 
Um, leather rot is a, a very serious problem in Ohio and uh, in some states it's worse than other states. It's usually associated with heavier soils and uh, um, um, poor drain soils. But at any rate, this is a typical symptom. Um, leather rot's particularly problematic in that uh, what infected fruit have a terrible taste and smell. But the taste is just horrible. And oftentimes people will see this uh, uh, white area and think it's just underripe, cut it off, and go ahead and put the strawberries on the shortcake and uh, go ahead and eat it. And it tastes terrible so they know where they got the berries and they're a little bit upset about it. Also we found that uh, one or two berries and a gallon of uh, of uh, infect or a gallon of fruit will throw the f flavor off of jams. So leather rot is a uh, it's kind of the producer's nightmare. If you got even one percent of it in your planting, Mike, uh, we lost just we lost briefly. your audio just yeah. for a second. So um, I don't know what happened, but just uh, maybe if you want to repeat, if you said anything important, we better hear it again. Well, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what cut out. I hope everything's important. But anyway, uh, at this point, I'm just going to keep going. I was talking about leather rot. Uh, I'll back up a little bit on that. But uh, leather rot um, um, is a kind of a nightmares producer, and the fact that it produces a very bad taste, and uh, um, sometimes the fruit doesn't really look like it's rotted. It just don't maybe underripe, and people will use those and. Uh, it really results in some serious uh, customer relations when people get bad taste in berries. At any rate, um, when we look at the disease, uh, this is an affected fruit in the field. This is, uh, uh, in time, these infected fruit actually dry down and, call, and develop into these things we call mummies. It's actually a combination of the pathogen and the host. It's a hard dry object. But inside of that thing is a thick walled resting oospore of uh, Phytophthora cactorum. And this oospore can stay in the soil for 30 years. And I'll just bet you any place where there's been strawberry production, uh, these oospores are present in the grounds. But the key thing about this oospore is it's just going to sit there until you have saturated soil. So the key to the, this disease is saturated soil, water, water uh, saturated soil. Um, once you get that for a relatively short period of time, uh, they germinate and form sporangia. And these sporangia then uh, develop uh, what's called zoospores, little biflagellate uh, spores similar to a sperm cell uh, that can actually swim in the water, in the soil, and in puddles. And uh, therefore, the key to controlling leather rot is drainage. Anytime I see standing water in a strawberry field, I cringe. Um, here's a, uh, uh, a fruit with uh, Phytophthora actually sporulating on it. You can bet that that water is just uh, full of zoospores. So every time a, a raindrop hits in there, it just splashes the healthy fruit and it's off and running. And uh, you've got an epidemic on your hands. So understanding the fact that saturated soil is important for this disease should help us to control it. And for me, the, the major control for leather rot are cultural practices. Um, uh, primarily uh, site selection, good soil drainage, and the use of mulch. Now I just went over those things. That's kind of uh, like the first half of the talk. I just tried to show you some instances where, where understanding uh, or that demonstrate that when we understand more about the diseases, the better equipped we're going to be to control them. And I think botrytis is probably the, the real classic example where we've really made strides in, in understanding the disease and, and controlling it better. But moving on into an integrated uh, management program, again, I tried to emphasize the importance of disease uh, uh, biology or a knowledge of it. Disease resistance, cultural practices, biocontrol, uh, and minimal fungicide use. Disease resistance, uh, you know, it's a no-brainer. It's the first line of defense. If you got resistance, you use it. In my extension programming in Ohio, I say leaf spot diseases, you better be looking at resistance for those or you're going to be doing a lot of extra spraying. Um, and in the past, at least, we've had some excellent varieties with good leaf spot resistance. Unfortunately, we do not have good resistance to the fruit rots. There is some potential for resistance in anthracnose and some of the uh, uh, plastic culture or, or annual uh, uh, varieties, but it's really not out there yet. So, if we don't have uh, uh, any resistance, we're completely dependent upon fungicide use 
or uh, cultural practices for the controls. So fungicides are very, very important for uh, controlling uh, fruit rots on strawberries. Fortunately, we have an excellent arsenal of fungicides for controlling all the major fruit rot diseases, botrytis, leather rot, and anthracnose. Um, I could give you a whole day workshop on the use of fungicides. I do have a handout that's going to be available to print off. Uh, uh, Laura should be able to get it to you. Uh, at any rate, I want to go through and mention a few things, but this is going to be pretty brief. For fungicides for botrytis, we just, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, we started losing fungicides, and I was concerned we weren't going to have any, but we have an excellent arsenal of fungicides for uh, control of botrytis, and all of these, uh, these would be the um, uh, the Cadillac fungicides um, over on this side. Uh, um, all of them are excellent. Thompson I would probably put at the bottom of the list because uh, it's been around so long there's probably resistance. But Switch, Elevate, Pristine, and Scala, wonderful materials for Botrytis. I like to use them combined with Captan early in the season. The combination may help uh, with some fungicide uh, uh, resistance. Um, prevention. Also using captan with it early uh, may help uh, uh, prevent some of the buildup of uh, anthracnose in the planting um, on those uh, apparently healthy looking leaves. Uh, anthracnose fruit rot, uh, let me mention one other thing, all of these fungicides are in different classes of chemistry so they can all be alternated with each other in resistance management schemes. For anthracnose, in the past we had captan and thyram, not really very effective. Captan's not bad, but you got to spray an awful lot of it if you've got a problem with anthracnose. Fairly recently the strobal urine fungicides abound. Um, Trying to use my pointer. Bound, Cabrio, and Pristine were introduced. These are really Cadillacs for anthracnose and really gave us some effective tools for controlling it. Switch is a fantastic material for botrytis, but it also does a good job against anthracnose. So fortunately, we do have some good uh, fungicides to help us uh, in control of anthracnose. Leather rot. Um, we actually have quite a few. In the past, uh, Captan and Thyram, again, were the only things that were available, not very effective, but uh, Ritamil's, Ritamil's been around a long time, but it's very effective for leather rot control. The phosphorus acid fungicides, uh, Phosstrol, uh, Agrifos, Topaz, Profite, and Oliet are very effective for leather rot control. And the strobal urines, again, uh, remember these strobal urines. These, these things are excellent uh, fungicides to help us with strawberry disease management. Azoxystrobin abound, pyroclostrobin, cabrio, and pristine. Pristine, um, all of these are excellent for leather rot as well. Um, Again, I have some suggested guidelines. They should be, you should be able to print them out uh, uh, at the end of this presentation. If not, contact me and I'll be happy to get, get them to you. But uh, I've tried to, to outline everything, all my uh, best recommendations for using fungicides for controlling strawberry fruit Great. rots. Yes? Mike? Hello? Thank you so much. Um, that was very good. Yeah. And I... Um, I just want to let people know that when we move to the very final portion of this program, we will be able to download your handout, which is very comprehensive, so uh, I'll point directly to that to folks. Mm -hmm. And we do have a couple of extra minutes, so if people would like to ask um, Dr. Ellis a question, this, is the t this would be a good time. So other than that one question from Gwyn Smith about uh, Everbearing, disease control? Well, they're probably thinking about it, and we'll have another opportunity at the end of the program so that you can do that as well. Um, I just, I wanted to check, I, I don't see SCALA listed in the New York State guidelines um, for use in New York State yet, so I just wanted to mention that for New York State growers. Um, and there's a couple people t typing right now, so maybe they know better, they probably do. Um, but while we're getting that answer, let me change this and we'll, uh, okay. Okay, um, Kathy Heidenreich is answering that and Scala is um, listed in the PMAP, so it is labeled for strawberry gray mold. And Alan has a question. I had, I had a couple of uh, uh, just other real quick comments. 
first of all, in relation to these uh, strobal urines, abound in Cabrio, they're the best for anthracnose fruit rot. And Mike, we lost you for a second. Rot and depression. Um, Mike, we're losing your audio for some reason. And one last, I, I had some other stuff, but... Okay, keep can going. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. I don't know why it went Can out. you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Well, uh, actually I had a couple other points to make here. Okay, okay pristine. Great. Pristine is an outstanding material can you hear me? Yeah, you cut Hello? out a little bit. Pris Mike, go ahead. All right, all right. Pristine uh, is an outstanding material for controlling strawberry fruit rots. It's a combination of cabrio or the strobal urine and boscolid, which is a botrytis and a um, um, powdery mildew material. But it is the only one fungicide that provides excellent control of all three of the major fruit rots, botrytis, anthracnose, and leather rot. It's good for leaf spots, good for powdery mildew, and it'll give us some post-harvest control of botrytis. I was going to mention some things on cultural practices, but I guess I'll stop right here. All right, we have one other question um, from Chautauqua County. They're talking about at what rate should the chemical be applied, and I think all of that is in the guidelines, so you'll have to check that for whatever state. All, all, of, that, all of that is in the guidelines. One thing I would like to um, emphasize is, um, especially when we're um, in plastic culture, whenever I'm uh, making a spray for botrytis, or anything. I'd like to include captan into the program early. Uh, I think it's going to help prevent some of the buildup of anthracnose if anthracnose is an issue. So especially in plastic culture, I'd like to keep captan in the in virtually about every spray up until the point you have to worry about visible residues on fruit. Once you start getting fruit uh, developed and you worry about visible residues, you have to back off on the captan because you don't want those visible residues. And all these other materials will not result in visible residues. All right, great. We have one other question, um, Mike, from Alan, and he's wondering about biocontrols for these diseases. Uh, biocontrols, you know, I, I really wish that there were some things out there that I could recommend for biocontrols, uh, but quite frankly, there are not. Uh, and I'm not prepared to recommend them unless I know they're going to take care of the, of, uh, of the situation under heavy disease pressure. I know that there are a few materials out there. I've tested them, but uh, um, um, I just haven't found anything that I've uh, incorporated into my... Uh, um, uh, recommendations. All right, yet. great. Um, and Sonia Schloman has a um, great comment about getting pristine. It was a challenge this year for growers, so buying ahead is a, a good idea. And then Kathy Heidenreich has put the link to the um, label for some of this um, the materials that we're talking about, so that would be helpful. Thank you both for those comments. And thank you, Dr. Ellis, for your presentation. I'm hoping you're going to be still here because I anticipate that we'll probably have some more questions. And um, now we're going to switch slightly um, to uh, Dr. David Godori. And let me just try to um, bring up. Oh, I think this is the wrong one. Hold on. This is the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> that was a practice one that we had. Um, here we go. Sorry about that, Dr. Godori. Let me try to get your share screen on. Um, Dr. Godori, we're going to be looking at his presentation right off of his computer because he had a couple of graphs that didn't come through, so he practiced this earlier, and it worked beautifully. So let me see if we can find that. You know what? I think I'm going to bring up a brand new SharePod um, David, and then you can just go right to your computer screen, and I'll let you turn your microphone. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. And David, you could just click your microphone on when you're ready. 
Well, they do it this Great. Um, Dr. Gadori is a plant pathologist with Cornell University. Gadori is a plant working out of the Agricultural Experiment Station in Geneva, and he has done a lot of work with strawberry powdery mildew, and um, we're very pleased to have him. So, uh, David, I'll just turn this over to you. Um, David, if you want to toggle on your speaker, and Mike, if you could toggle off yours. David, try that um, toggle on, toggle off a couple times perhaps. Um, maybe it'll do it for you. I'm not hearing you. I don't know if anybody else can hear you. Okay, yeah, maybe come down and toggle it on before you fill up your... There you go. We're watching what you're doing. Perfect. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, now we're back. Okay. Uh, so, do that. And now... We do yeah, that. There you go. Great. Great. All right, now can everyone hear me? Yes, Hello? I bet. You guys can put agree if you can hear them. It looks like they can hear you. Terrific. Okay, good. And, and well, then off we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you can see by the, uh, the number of authors on the title slide, uh, I'm the one that's talking today, but this is, uh, this is not really an individual effort. It, it represents about three years of collaborative work uh, between Cornell's Department of Plant Pathology at Geneva and some colleagues of ours uh, in, of all places, Norway's National Agricultural Research Center near Oslo. Now, I come to strawberry powdery mildew from a background of about 20 years of research on a, a closely related disease, uh, powdery mildew of grapevine. Uh, what I find intriguing uh, about strawberry powdery mildew are there many parallels between these two diseases. So in the next few minutes, I'd, I'd like to go over some things uh, we know and, and, and that we don't know about this disease because we've only generated new knowledge on the biology and ecology of the pathogen. And we've also had to, uh, unfortunately, unlearn some long-established facts regarding strawberry uh, powdery mildew. So let's get started on that. Well, all living organisms are, uh, are subject to classification by a group of scientists who, who call themselves taxonomists. Now, taxonomists are the, the people who choose the names for these pathogens. Uh, they're a lot like tax attorneys in that they, they tend to create confusion and then they profit by it. And the name of the moment that they've applied to the strawberry powdery mildew is Podosphora aphanis. Uh, but you will find that in, uh, in many other publications listed by many other names. It's, it's all the same pathogen. There really is only one powdery mildew on strawberry, uh, and it goes by many names. So just keep that in mind. It's all the same pathogen. Uh, with respect to powdery mildews in general, I think we've been lulled into a sense of complacency uh, about powdery mildews in general, because for many years, as, as Mike pointed out, uh, We've had a wealth of very effective fungicides that limit the amount of damage they can inflict. Uh, however, powdery mildews as a group are historically among the most troublesome pathogens with respect to fungicide resistance. In fact, complete failures of entire classes of our best modern fungicides have now been reported for a number of different powdery mildews on, on different crops. And it's, it's quite possible that we may see a similar pattern of resistance uh, eventually in strawberry. So resistance management and the minimal use of fungicides as they're needed is, is a very important factor to consider when you're deploying fungicides against this pathogen. It has a very high potential to develop resistance. Uh, when this resistance uh, inevitably occurs in some of these fungi, uh, fungicides, uh, there may be very little in the research pipeline that will replace uh, the fungicides that we have today. Uh, that should especially concern us as we move towards production in systems uh, such as high tunnels 
where powdery mildews uh, can develop uh, much more explosively than they do in open fields. So I've taken as the, uh, the inspiration for this talk uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Mark Twain, who observed that it ain't what we don't know that's the problem, it's what we do know that ain't so. And I've used that as the, uh, the organizational, organizational structure of the talk. Uh, we'll start with what we thought we knew that is not necessarily so, and then we'll move on to what we didn't know until quite recently. So let's get started on that. It would be reasonable to assume that this pathogen, like many powdery mildews, infects uh, the meristematic tissues deep within the crown of the plant and survives winter there. Uh, it's easy enough to find this assumption stated as a fact in, in many sources on this disease. The trouble is that when you try to find conclusive experimental proof for this as a form of overwintering uh, in any of the previous research, it, it's just not there. In fact, when we stripped dormant crowns of the mildew-infected leaves and then forced them to regrow in confinement, they remained mildew-free. And significantly, when we did not remove those senescent but persistent leaves, a small but very important percentage of the plants developed mildew on the new leaves as they emerged. So the source of infection seems to be those persistent leaves, not uh, overwintering in the crowns. So we can't prove that the fungus never survives in the crown. It's, it's very difficult to prove a negative, only that we can't detect it. And neither has anyone else to our knowledge. However, these senescent, persistent leaves appear to be quite suitable for carrying the pathogen through winter, often uh, very well protected under layers of mulch or fleece, and in places with, uh, with real winter, uh, snow. And I'm going to return to those uh, persistent leaves in a minute, but I want to first move on to the next thing that we thought we knew, but recently had to rethink. And that's the role of these small spherical uh, spore-containing structures here, which you can see as I move the cursor around. Uh, those structures form late in the season, and they're called Cleistothesia. They form in the mildew colony. Uh, these are Cleistothesia forming on the underside of a severely mildewed leaf. Uh, because no one had ever succeeded in infecting strawberry plants with the spores contained in these Cleistothesia, they were routinely dismissed as a major source of infection. Now, over the last three years, uh, we've learned much more about these as sources of primary infection. We've learned that, like many powdery mildews, strawberry powdery mildew is composed of two mating types, essentially male and female types. That means that the populations are uh, essentially divided. Both of those have to be present, and then they have to be paired on the same leaf before those Cleistothesia will form. Consequently, formation of Cleistothesia is, uh, is affected by disease severity and by time. There has to be enough disease, and for a long enough period, that the compatible mating types become paired on that same leaf. Uh, essentially, they have to find each other. Once they do, the Cleistothesia are initiated, and thereafter they take about four weeks before they look mature. However, they need a much longer period before they become uh, physiologically mature and are able to release those infectious spores. In the field, that uh, maturation process is delayed by the arrival of winter temperatures. Uh, but in spring, the when the strawberry plants resume development, so do the Cleistothesia. I'll have more to say in a minute about which leaves are susceptible, but when susceptible leaves are inoculated with spores from overwintered Cleistothesia, it, it's really not difficult to reproduce uh, this disease. So they are a functional and often very abundant source of primary infection. I had mentioned leaf susceptibility. There are a number of reports in the literature noting that powdery mildew of strawberry is found primarily on the lower surface of older leaves, and therefore the lower surface must be more susceptible or the pathogen is very uh, sensitive to solar radiation. Now, those are reasonable speculations because they're easily supported by observations in the field. The disease is indeed more common uh, in commercial plantings on the lower surface of older leaves. But in fact, when we conducted 
controlled uh, inoculations of strawberry leaves at different stages of development, we found that first, only the very youngest leaves were highly susceptible. Uh, secondly, there's no difference in the susceptibility of the upper or lower surface of those leaves. And lastly, the upper leaf surface escapes infection during the susceptible stage because it's obscured by, by leaf folding. Uh, you can see how highly folded uh, these very young and very susceptible leaves are. Uh, by the time that upper surface is exposed, the leaf has essentially developed age-related or what we call ontogenic resistance to powdery mildew, and that resistance, that, that natural resistance of the older leaves is quite suppress, uh, suppressive towards new infections. So the end result is that the disease is often confined to the lower leaf surface until quite late in the season. Uh, but the distribution of the disease on the lower leaf surface of older leaves has more to do with the opportunity uh, to infect a particular leaf surface during that narrow window of susceptibility than it has to do with any other factor. Now, I said I would return to the subject of uh, the senescent but persistent green leaves that often survive winter. Uh, Strawberry is not a typical deciduous perennial plant that sheds its leaves in autumn. Uh, in powdery mildews of many, if not most, uh, deciduous perennial plants, the Cleistothesia are readily dispersed by rain from colonies on the leaves, uh, and then they tend to attach to the bark of those perennial plants where they survive winter. But the Cleistothesia on strawberry leaves are very tightly bound to the mildew colony, and they're very resistant to removal. In fact, they're quite well embedded in a, a sort of a rat's nest of uh, these hyphae, these uh, thread-like uh, structures of the fungus, and that keeps them uh, very well attached to the leaf. They've, they've obviously learned over uh, several millions of years that these leaves aren't going anywhere, uh, and, and so why should they? Well, if the Cleistothesia are one source of primary inoculum and the colonies overwintering on the senescent leaves are the only other source, what would happen if we eliminated both? And we've just completed the, uh, the third year of field trials in uh, both New York and Norway uh, to try to answer that question. Without getting into too much detail, we essentially established pathogen-free plantings from either seedlings or from tissue culture plants, and then we left them unsprayed for powdery mildew. Now, even though these were within 200 yards of severely diseased plantings, and they're located in, are in areas where uh, both commercial strawberry production is present, and there are numerous wild strawberry plants, those plantings established from uh, clean plants, uh, they started clean, and they developed only traces of powdery mildew during year one, even though they were never sprayed with fungicides. And these were highly susceptible varieties. While nothing lasts forever, uh, when the plants were left untreated for two years, uh, the disease eventually increased to severe levels on the foliage and occasionally on the fruit. But the experiments clearly showed that the benefit uh, is there from starting with mildew-free plants. Uh, the level of disease was influenced far more by the resident uh, pathogen population than by contamination from outside sources. So, what are the applications of, of this new biological and epidemiological information on pathogen, uh, on the pathogen? First, there are substantial benefits to be gained from starting with mildew-free plants and taking steps to keep them in that condition for as long as possible. By doing so, uh, you may first avoid contaminating the planting by introducing the pathogen on senescent leaves. That's one source of inoculum you can uh, greatly reduce or even eliminate. Secondly, you can prevent the formation of Cleistothesia, perhaps indefinitely, as their formation requires severe and protracted disease because the pathogen population is composed of two mating types. So unless the disease gets severe or persists for a very long period of time, uh, those Cleistothesia will not form. That's the only other source of primary inoculum. Uh, thirdly, you'll improve the performance and increase the longevity of the fungicides that are applied and reduce uh, the risk of fungicide resistance. 
that's going to become increasingly important as uh, the number of available fungicides dwindles and the remaining options are inherently uh, perhaps less active against this pathogen. Now, additionally, uh, the rapid development of ontogenic or age-related resistance in strawberry leaves means that it's the very youngest foliage that has to be the target of the fungicides directed against powdery mildew. If you effectively uh, protect those disease, they very soon become resistant and uh, will no longer require your assistance. If you fail to do so, there's very little that you can do to eradicate the established and very well protected colonies on the lower surface deep within the plant canopy. And so I'll, I'll leave you with these words of wisdom. Uh, start clean and keep it clean. I'll thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions in, in whatever time remains. And I haven't touched on uh, varietal resistance, but we can uh, deal with that in the question period. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, David. And um, I see a couple of people typing, so perhaps we're going to get questions. Uh, Dr. Mike Ellis and Dr. David Godori are still here for some questions, so please um, take the opportunity. We have a, a little bit extra time, and um, they were two terrific presentations. I do want to, while people are typing, I do want to say that some of you may have had some somewhat broken audio. And I am not sure why that happens. I think it has something to do with bandwidth. Um, and depending upon the usage, perhaps you're at a major institution and there's a lot of usage that may affect why, um, why you're not getting consistent audio. And I think it's different for every location. Uh, one thing that I can say is that we did find that people who are on a wireless connection that does seem to result in a more broken audio. So um, that, that's something that you might want to consider. Um, Molly Shaw has a question here. It says, do dormant plants from the nursery tend to come with powdery mildew on the few clinging leaves? And how do you make sure you start a planting without powdery mildew? And uh, are there any uh, owners of uh, strawberry nurseries on the line here <laughs> before, before I get into trouble? <laughs> okay. Uh, there's no way of knowing uh, without a microscopic inspection of the plants whether or not they carry powdery mildew. It's very likely, though, that they do, uh, although the nurseries tend to intensively uh, spray those plants. Uh, not so much in the United States, but in Europe, uh, the nursery plants that are heavily sprayed are thought to be one of the primary means by which fungicide resistant strains are introduced uh, and that becomes a particular problem in the high tunnel production which is much more common in Europe. Uh, here I, I couldn't say. Uh, certainly if you're getting tissue culture plants or plants grown from seed uh, there's much less of a possibility or a likelihood that they're coming in with powdery mildew. Uh, otherwise I think you, uh, uh, you just take your chances. All right, great. Um, we have a couple of other people that are typing, and um, I'm going to uh, move. I'm going to move us uh, into the final setting so that people can download the handouts while we are talking. Uh, I don't know if you folks. So I think this is for David. Um, Marvin Pritz has a question about managing powdery mildew in high tunnels. All of the things that I mentioned regarding the management of powdery mildew in, uh, in field plantings become much more important uh, in high tunnel production. Certainly, uh, if you had uh, the option of growing a, a variety with good uh, base level of powdery mildew resistance, that becomes almost critical in high tunnel production. Uh, if you're receiving uh, dormant crowns, and you suspect that there may be powdery mildew mycelium harbored on those uh, persistent green leaves, uh, you may want to consider actually stripping those before the planting is started. Uh, thereafter, you want to be especially diligent with the application of fungicides, in particular uh, as those new leaves emerge. And to keep that uh, epidemic under almost continual suppression, in particular if you're growing a, a highly mildew susceptible variety. 
All right, great. There's also a question about wild strawberry as a source of inoculum. Uh, it's, it's minimally important for powdery mildew. And then Chautauqua Co County has a question um, about rec recommending, what do you recommend for application equipment to use um, for the application of fungicides? And maybe this is actually for both uh, Dr. Ellis and Dr. Godori. I'll let Mike go first. Okay. Mike, do you want to, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes, beautifully. Um, you know, well, when you get into application equipment, that's kind of a science onto itself. And ever since I started working with strawberries, this question comes up. You've got a range from people putting uh, materials on through the irrigation system, through all kinds of different sprayers. And what I tell people is, number one, I don't know what the best system is, but the most important thing is you've got to have a system that's going to give you complete coverage of what you're trying to spray. And I can't get any better than that. I would say only that the, uh, the, the timing of those fungicides and the choice of the materials uh, in conjunction with all of the other things you should be doing to manage powdery mildew are probably uh, more important than the particular piece of equipment, assuming the equipment is suitable for spraying strawberries in the first place. I, I have, I mean, that's, that's well said. There's no doubt about that. One thing that's just kind of a, um, an observation, if you will, um, if you are in a program where you are going to be uh, spraying, um, you know you're going to be spraying a lot. I think the layout of the field has is, is very important. I think it's important to have some grass strips that you can actually run the tractor on and have a sprayer that's going to deliver out about 10 rows uh, to keep you out of that planting. Um, um, most of the growers that I know up here or in Ohio are doing that and it, it really makes life an awful lot easier. All right, that is excellent. Um, if I want to draw people's attention to, there's two, the fungicides for strawberry fruit rots. Um, that is a uh, uh, um, handout that Dr. Mike Ellis developed, and you can upload that onto your own computer. It's very comprehensive. And then there's a powdery mildew um, fact sheet that you might also want to have. I will add um, the uh, PowerPoint publication from Dr. David Godori to this so you can access it later but I'm just having some problems doing that right now but that will be available on the recorded version and I just uh, want to let people know they have a few more minutes before we even reach two o'clock if anybody has any other questions but yes hey, Laura um, if, if you could make my uh, PowerPoint available I'd okay, appreciate I'd be it happy too to do that. Certainly. And uh, um, when we get, when we get into questions, I'd like to address that one about uh, plastic culture versus matted row in terms of the fruit rot sprays. Yeah, and, and I stuff. think we're right there, so you can go ahead and talk about that. Okay. Um, first of all, um, the, the, you know the difference between matted row, uh, um, con uh, the control of fruit rots and matted row, and and the plastic culture or annual production is, is just a world apart. And the point uh, well made that uh, in the annual production you've got this constant flush or, or, or flushings of, of uh, um, um, flowers that need to be protected for botrytis control. At any rate, in perennial matted row, I think it's a pretty simple system. Um, uh, at least in Ohio, we do very, very few sprays uh, prior to the initiation of bloom. Uh, we target sprays during bloom, and this is fairly easy to do. You've got to do it for each variety, but you've usually got about a two-week, no more than three, that you target uh, sprays for botrytis control. And then pit growers kind of play it by ear. If, if it's a normal year and it's not hot and it's not extremely wet, uh, you may not need very many more sprays. But in hot years, you might have to think about some anthracnose sprays or if you saw anthracnose the year before. At any rate, um, I think you've got a lot more options and you can, you can look at the weather more. You, can, you have more IPM type things that you can consider in perennial matted row. In plastic culture, I don't think you have the leeway for that. The investment that you have, uh, just the nature, the, the, um, it seems like the introduction of anthracnose on uh, 
tips and, and on plants is, is very, very common. And um, at least if I had my investment in a plastic culture planting, I would maintain a pretty strict straw or uh, fungicide program uh, starting early in the season uh, with just straight captan to keep populations of anthracnose down. When bloom came, I'd have a, f a program that's going to control uh, all the major fruit rots. And we and if you look at the the options, you can put together a program that'll take you right up through harvest. It's pretty intensive, but if you let something like anthracnose get loose on you in, in those plantings it's uh yeah you, you just can't get back on top of all right that's a great point um it looks like there's a question kathy heidenreich says asks would straw over the plastic help reduce fruit rods well this is um i didn't quite finish my talk here this afternoon um but at any rate i would did want to mention um cultural practices Straw is extremely beneficial in the planting uh, for preventing fruit rots. Almost all or all of the uh, diseases are, are spread pretty well with splash dispersal and straw um, uh, between the rows, especially in perennial matted rows, I'd never want to see soil. Never want berries in contact with soil. Leather rot's just going to be a major problem. Uh, at any rate, a good layer of straw mulch, we've shown that uh, even on, f on uh, fairly poorly drained sites, a good solid layer of mulch will give you a very, very good control of leather rot. It protects uh, the fruit from contact with the soil. Even if you get puddling on top of the soil, uh, the rain the, or the uh, straw breaks up the raindrops and it prevents it from splashing. It has a very profound effect on splash dispersal. I think even in plastic culture, if you can afford it, there ought to be something between those rows rather than just bare soil. I think it's more important in the uh, in the perennial matted row, but uh, um, you know a lot of our growers will put a layer of straw down in between the rows on, in their plastic culture as well. It's, it, it really goes a long right, way. Thank you. And then Alan has a question about whether or not insects play a role in the spread of fruit rots. Um, I think insects are their own problem. When I think about uh, controlling these fruit rots and, and the development of these fruit rots, insects to me uh, are not a, a, a major uh, factor in their spread. Um, uh, if they are, I'm just not aware of it. They, they're, they're kind of their own problem that have to be taken care of uh, within the overall um, management and, program. Um, there is another question probably for both of you. Uh, Chautauqua County asks if there's an advantage to applying a fungicide now before you put the straw down. I'll, I'll, I'd like to go first on that. Um, when 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 a lot of the real good work on botrytis was done, there there was really some tremendous work done. A lot of it by uh, um, Sutton up in uh, Guelph, uh, Wilcox and and Pritz in in New York. We did some in Ohio, but there were a lot of things looked at, and one of them was uh, an application of uh, fungicide in the fall. I think it's a waste of money. Um, um, I would not recommend it. Uh, if you want to try it, do it. Uh, it's certainly not against the law, but I think it's a waste of money. I think uh, um, um, you're still going to have plenty of inoculum there to start out in the spring, and I think I'd, I'd uh, put my emphasis on, on targeting uh, a program at protecting the, the blooms. Um, we did do some work here in Ohio, and I could never find any benefits from it. I'd, I'd agree with that, Mike. Uh, for for powdery mildew in particular, uh, the Cleistothecium is has evolved to uh, to withstand a very harsh environment, and it's it's very resistant to penetration by fungicides that are applied in fall. So you're much better off reducing the amount of disease, and that alone will prevent the formation of the overwintering structure, than you would be in trying to eradicate it once it's formed. Uh, so by the time fall rolls around. Uh, it's really too late to do much about powdery mildew for the following year in, in terms of applying a fungicide to uh, get at the overwintering stage. It is a good question and it's been looked at, but like I said, I, I don't recommend All right. it. Um, I, I have to admit I did not have time and I apologize to put any uh, final um, polling questions to you folks, but I, 
I do hope that you enjoyed these talks. I thought they were absolutely wonderful, and it's great to be able to have access to nationally known experts on these topics, so it's really nice um, without having to drive to Ohio. And uh, so it's great to have both uh, Dr. David Gadori and Dr. Mike Ellis, and I want to thank you. Uh, sure. um, Laura, I'd like to make one more comment before we break up. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave didn't mention anything about varietals um, um, susceptibility, but for me, uh, one of the major things that I try to push in my extension programs, uh, mainly for leaf spots and, and powdery mildew, um, I'm not an expert on powdery mildew, but um, you know we have some very good resistance, and especially when I first started uh, um, working with strawberries, uh, the the varieties coming out of our USDA program and, and Gene Galetta, they really had excellent and still do have excellent resistance to the leaf spots and, and uh, a lot of varieties. You just don't have to spray for powdery mildew, and then all of a sudden we'll start getting some introduced, and they're just indicators for powdery mildew and leaf spot, and uh, I I try to tell our growers. Well, you really better check these varieties out, and if you're dealing with an, uh, a case of extreme susceptibility, you ought to try to avoid it, or you're going to be spraying. And I still think we have some excellent uh, uh, resistance in a lot of different varieties that people could take uh, advantage of, and it's especially true resistance when we talk about the uh, uh, the root rot diseases. Um, uh, we really need to emphasize uh, uh, the use of resistance whenever we can get it. I would, I would go along with that, Mike, especially uh, as you move towards high tunnel production, uh, powdery mildew is, is not uh, routinely destructive under field conditions. It is routinely destructive in high tunnels, in particular when you're growing a, a mildew susceptible variety. And so very often we develop these attachments to certain varieties because they have just, uh, well, they have wonderful taste, good horticultural properties. And in field plantings, we can manage powdery mildew with fungicides. Uh, it's a very different world, as, as uh, you'll, you quickly find out when you move into high tunnel production. And the resistant varieties there, uh, it, it just makes a lot of sense to start with that as the, as the base of the disease management program. All right, th those are wonderful points. And there is a question about um, powdery mildew resistant varieties um, in our uh, in our particular guidelines we don't have any listed we'd have some that are definitely um, susceptible and that those would be listed in the guidelines but maybe um, maybe Mike or David you have some that you know are actually resistant to powdery mildew that you could I I don't have them uh, memorized, but in all of our literature, and I know in the uh, Mid-Atlantic Berry uh, Guide and, and in our literature, there's tables that have uh, the relative susceptibility uh, for almost, you know, most of the currently uh, um, uh, used varieties. And uh, I think the information's fairly reliable. Um, I, a few kind of stick out in mind that are extremely susceptible, this uh, Dar Select is one that <laughs> is uh, is really an indicator for powdery mildew, but that's another reason I like to emphasize, you know, having these resources, this information, having it and uh, and referring to it. But I'm sure that uh, you all have some information on relative susceptibility of the varieties to leaf spots and powdery mildew. Yeah, I I would check the uh, the extension resources online or the published resources sure. to see. Uh, not only what's resistant to powdery mildew, but what has some pretty broad-based resistance to some of the other diseases as well. Uh, you don't want to have a resistant variety to powdery mildew and then you know take comfort in that as it as it rots. Oh yeah, you know one thing. I was up talking to the growers in Nova Scotia several years ago, and I didn't realize you know leaf scorch. It just never seems like a serious disease to me. Never saw it much. It's because we have excellent resistance. I guess up there it's just a horrible disease and if you don't have leaf scorch resistance you don't you don't raise strawberries up there. So. Well thank you guys very much. I will try to get my hands on a table and also post that in this file share so that people can access that quickly for both uh, some of the other diseases, um, leaf, leaf spots as well as fruit rots and certainly powdery mildew. We'll try to make sure that that is available to all of you. 
Um, again, I want to thank the speakers. I want to thank all of you that have joined this webinar. I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, the next webinar is the only one of the series that will be on a Friday. It's Friday, October 30th at 1 o'clock in the afternoon again. Um, all of you that are registered will receive the connection information for that, and that will be on weed control in strawberries. Um, Dr. Marvin Pritz and Dr. Robin Bellander will be talking about cultural and chemical control options. And um, I also want to urge those of you who have enjoyed these to please um, let other people know, especially growers who might be somewhat reluctant to try this particular uh, form of program delivery. We think it's very accessible and I think they're going to be pleased with how easy it is and the quality of the lectures. So please talk to your colleagues and other growers and farmers. Um, we'd love to have more people. We have room for um, about a hundred people to, to join in on one lecture as a live lecture. So I just want to urge you, we're going to do a little PR blast so you'll hear more about us in the near future. And thank you again uh, for attending.